he asked me to start things in his place. Um, in his tradition, I did, um, I still don't know where he gets all of his uh, historical pearls, but I found a couple of them that I thought were interesting. Um, on this day in 1915, Dr. Alois Alzheimer's actually died of heart failure at the, at the young age of 51. He was a German psychiatrist and neurologist who was credi credited with actually identifying neurofibrillar tangles in the brain that he, of a patient that he had followed who had dementia. And um, interestingly enough, later there was controversy surrounding this finding, and a lot of people thought that he had misidentified uh, the pathology. Uh, but his original slides were found in the 1990s, um, and at that point they restained them and looked at them, and, and yes, in fact, he had identified the uh, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. So I thought that was pretty interesting that uh, even this, that long later, we could um, actually find some information. In 1943, Dr. William DeVries was born. There is a connection to Louisville here. He was instrumental in developing the Jarvik 7 artificial heart. And um, you, for those of you that are very young, you might not know that the first implantation of this was done um, at Audubon Hospital here in Louisville. One of his patients, Dr. Dentist Barney Clark, uh, survived for nearly two years with the artificial heart, but was uh, largely confined to the hospital during this time prior to his death. Um, and then, um, in deference to the season, I just wanted to say in 1971, a CBS production of Homecoming, A Christmas Story, first introduced us to the Waltons. So, good night, John Boy. <laughs> and then also in uh, 1843, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol was published and uh, sold a whopping 6,000 copies at that time. It was considered uh, largely a success. Obviously, that wouldn't be considered so successful these days. Um, and this is a beloved story that has proved timeless and has resulted in numerous productions on stage, including here at Actors Theater. And I will say that um, uh, two of our faculty members' children are very instrumental in this year's production, Dr. Yvette um, Kua and Dr. Alan Ramirez. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I will now um, uh, yield the podium to Dr. Eleanor Lederer. I don't think it's possible to overstate the impact of diabetic nephropathy. I mean, end-stage kidney disease is probably the most dreaded complication of diabetes, and it is the most common cause of kidney failure in this country. And because this is such an important problem, I'm particularly pleased to introduce our guest today, Dr. Frank Brogius from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Brogius is the Professor of Medicine and Division Chief for Nephrology um, at the University of Michigan. Uh, he trained uh, and grew up initially in Kansas, but has spent considerable time um, at other places. So he's been at uh, the NIH, uh, he's been, uh, did some training in Ann Arbor, finished up with his uh, fellowships um, at the Beth Israel and then the Whitehead Institute before returning to Ann Arbor in 1989, where he's been since then. He has been uh, very well published and uh, very well funded throughout the years from the NIH. He's received a number of awards, including being an established investigator award. In addition to his research, however, um, he has been an active participant in all of the other facets of academic medicine. He's been on the program committee for the American Society of Nephrology. He's been a training program director for the nephrology program and been on the training program director um, executive committee. And he has been named a best doctor in America since the year 2005. He has spent um, most of his career studying uh, the mechanisms of diabetic nephropathy. And so it's with real pleasure that I asked Dr. Brogius to take the podium. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. Um, yeah, I wish my mom was here. Um, um, anyway, it is uh, a great honor to be here and to talk to you all about this, uh, as Eleanor said, this very important disease process. Um, uh, I will probably more than you want belabor that point for the first few slides, but I'll show you just to talk about uh, this uh, 
the enormity, really, of diabetic kidney disease and, and why we should all be concerned about it. Uh, but first, let me do a few requisite things. Uh, I do want to let you know that we have had some materials that uh, we've gotten from Lilly that I won't talk about um, that we've used in our more basic research. I have been a consultant for a number of companies and still am for these, but we do it through the University of Michigan, so I don't get any compensation from the companies, and um, nor is it reflected in my U of M paycheck. Uh, and so uh, we try and stay a relatively unconflicted. I do have some current funding to do a project for Takeda that is not uh, relevant to what I'll be talking about today, and none of those drugs will be mentioned. At the end of the talk, I will be talk talking about new treatments. None of those are going to be FDA approved for diabetic kidney disease, and I'll try and remind you of that. All right, so how do we find new treatments for diabetic kidney disease? This is what we'll talk about. Like I said, I'll, I'll emphasize what uh, Eleanor just said. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we know about diabetic kidney disease, which we knew more. Uh, and then we'll talk about how you screen for it and how we treat it and hopefully how we'll treat it in five years. I'm being optimistic there, but we'll try for a five-year plan. But I think, that, I think it's really an exciting time right now. In We're on the verge of really new treatments, and I'll hope to convince you of that uh, shortly. So to underline what Eleanor just told you about the enormity of diabetic kidney disease, this is a, a graph from the United States Renal Data System, which is uh, now uh, back in Ann Arbor, uh, where uh, it takes all the data from virtually all end-stage renal disease patients and, and crunches it every year. This is from last year's report. I tried to download this year's and couldn't, so that's a little, I'm going to talk to the guys about that. Uh, but uh, in any case, it shows very clearly what Eleanor just mentioned, is that diabetes is by far the most common cause of end-stage renal disease in the United States and is rapidly becoming so in the world. Um, the prevalence is continuing to go up. Uh, there is a little bit of flattening of the curve when you do it in terms of age-adjusted uh, 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 millions of people in the United States, and we'll talk a bit more about that, but by far the most common cause of end-stage renal disease. And that's no surprise to any of you in the room because most of you know that there's been a huge explosion in type 2 diabetes uh, over the last 30 years. Some good news recently, of course, that the CDC thinks finally that that, that growth has flattened off and maybe even declined a little bit. Uh, but there's been a tripling of diabetes in the, in the United States, type 2 diabetes, in the last 30 years. And, of course, type 2 diabetes comprises 90, 95 percent of all of our diabetic patients. So this is driving, driving all of our practices. And what's really scary is that this is true throughout the world, and it's really happening big time in the, in the developing world. Uh, my... Uh, Favorite medical journal is the New York Times. I read it every day. That's where I get all my information. So the rest of this talk is based entirely on New York Times articles. But, uh, but one of the ones that got my attention a couple of years ago was this one uh, showing how rapidly diabetes had grown. Uh, it's now more prevalent in China than it is in, in the United States. Um, and uh, about half of all Chinese adults have pre-diabetic pre blood glucose levels, so above 100. This was a small study, 99,000 people, uh, so it might not be accurate, but, uh, but I think it probably is. Uh, and, and I actually even went back to the primary article from JAMA, and these are just sort of the, the prevalence <coughs> percentages in China. Rapid increase in diabetes in all age groups, certainly more, more in the older group, but look at this at the young age group in terms of prediabetes. So if even a half of those go on to diabetic, you can do the math with one and a half billion people. It's a lot of folks with diabetes, a lot of people to get complications. So um, as I mentioned to you in the previous prevalence slide, if you look at incidence in terms of end-stage renal disease due to diabetes, there looks like there's a, a little bit of a, a flattening, maybe even a little bit of a decrease in, in total ESRD uh, end-stage renal disease due to diabetes. Um, Part of that may be uh, uh, due to some of the treatments that I'll talk about that we're doing and have been doing for the last 22 years, but, um, but uh, some of it uh, may just be to the, due to the fact that we're, um, people are 
getting there a little bit more slowly than they used to. So uh, uh, this is the natural history, if you will, of a diabetic kidney disease patient. It's actually uh, from Carl Mogensen's uh, graph from 30 years ago now, uh, more than 30 years ago, and it's still pretty much true, although we need to talk about some changes that we know uh, that have occurred over the last uh, 30 years. And this is taking your average diabetic patient and, and looking at, at what happens. And the point here that I really want to make is that it takes a real long time to get to end-stage renal disease with diabetes, uh, even back in the 1980s. And I think where we are now is that we push this curve out a little bit, and I'll try and show you some evidence for that. But, but basically, I think that uh, part of the reason for maybe the flattening of the of the incidence curve in diabetic nephropathy is that we're doing this. We're not ultimately going to have less people getting diabetic kidney disease, but we're going to have uh, have it happen a little bit more slowly. And uh, but but even looking at the data then, if you were a type one patient, it took you a good 20, 25, 30 years to get to end stage renal disease. And I'll remind you that only about 30 percent of all diabetic patients, whether they're type one or type two, develop diabetic kidney disease. Uh, and that's part of our challenge in identifying those patients. But I would say that if indeed it takes 30, 35 years now to get from initiation of uh, diabetes to your end-stage renal disease, we're just starting to see those folks that got diabetes over the last 30 years. So I don't think this flattening of the curve is going to last very long unless we do something. And clearly it's not in the rest of the world because in China, Boy, big time, uh, it is taking over as the major cause of kidney disease. <clears throat> Not totally in the country, but in big, big urban centers, it clearly does. The other point I'd like to made, make about diabetic kidney disease is that even if you don't get to end-stage renal disease but get a little bit of kidney disease, that's a bad thing. And it's, I think it's not, I think it's pretty well appreciated among nephrologists, but maybe, maybe not as much among other folks that what increases mortality in diabetes primarily is kidney disease. So folks who have type 2 diabetes, this is based on NHANES 3 data, it was a study by, done by the University of Washington group a couple years ago. Um, if you don't have any evidence of kidney disease, your standardized 10-year mortality is, is increased a bit over the, that for the general population with that bottom line, but not as much as you might think. But uh, I thought that was mine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but once, uh, once you get any evidence of kidney disease by either uh, abnormal amounts of albumin in the urine or any decrease in GFR, that mortality goes up tremendously. And, of course, if you have both, then you have, you know, a 60% 10-year mortality likelihood compared to those without kidney disease of a little over 10%. So that's a big impact on, uh, on mortality from having kidney disease and diabetes. This study that just came out in the Dinghy Journal, you can't read this. I circled these just to make a, a slight point, which is uh, that, that this is substantiating those initial results. Um, and that is that uh, at any age group, if you have no evidence of kidney disease, there's some increase in mortality for early age groups with diabetes, but by the time you're 65, there's no increase in mortality unless you have kidney disease. And if you have kidney disease and a decreased GFR, then you have a huge increase both for death from any cause and death from cardiovascular causes. So this is a pretty good article. It just came out about uh, a month and a half ago, two months ago in the New England Journal. So I hope I've convinced you that diabetic kidney disease is a big deal. It is what makes our diabetic patients die, and it's going to be with us unless we come up with better ideas and better treatments for both preventing disease so that increased cardiovascular mortality doesn't take place, and to prevent folks from going to end-stage renal disease where, I didn't bring this slide, but the average life expectancy for a diabetic patient at, at my age on dialysis is about two years. So. It's, it's roughly equivalent to metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So not a good thing to have.
All right, back to this, uh, back to this slide. So the other, another aspect of, of Mogensen's diagram, and that is still true for both type 1 and type 2 patients, is that um, there's a long lag period between the time you have clinically evident disease and a decrease in your GFR, um, but there's stuff going on in the kidney, right? So uh, we've relied over the years on detecting small amounts of abnormal amounts of albumin in the urine as sort of our first sign of diabetic kidney disease. And, um, and we'll see in a minute whether that's really true. Um, but during that lag period, there's a lot of stuff going on in the glomerulus primarily. Most people still think that the pathogenesis of diabetic kidney disease hits the glomerulus first before it affects the tubular interstitium. Some debate about that, uh, but I think by and large the evidence points that way. The first thing that can ever can be seen in any patient with diabetes, and, and certainly those that track toward uh, kidney disease, um, is an increase in the afferent arteriolar diameter. So there are a number of factors, not all of these are agreed upon, that cause an abnormal, non-physiologic increase in the diameter, blood flow, and blood pressure inside the glomerular capillaries. That's what causes what we call hyperfiltration. It's pretty clear that that's an important, not sufficient, but necessary step before you have uh, onset of true diabetic nephropathy. And then we're going to hone in on a little glomerular tuft here to look at the pathologic changes. So after that hyperfiltration, a couple of years, those that are destined to have progressive disease um, will develop the changes that are noted here. So this will happen again before any of those clinical indicators that we we're talking about. So there's uh, one of the first things that happens, as we know now, is actually damage to the glomerular epithelial cells, the podocytes. Uh, these actually show evidence of injury and, and actually fall off so that there's actually fewer podocytes uh, in patients who have early diabetic kidney disease, and that's a very good prognostic indicator of how they're going to do. So the fewer podocytes you have, the more likely you'll have progressive disease. The same is true, and has been known for longer, that uh, expansion of the extracellular matrix due to accumulation of extracellular matrix proteins, different collagens, laminins, fibronectin, this has a very, uh, very uh, tight uh, prognostic uh, uh, correlation with uh, progressive disease in the future. Uh, there's also thickening of the basement membrane through a similar process, and all of those things are, are important, it appears in the pathogenesis of the disease and, again, predict badness in the, in the future. And then there are later changes that affect both the ar arterioles, um, both the afferent and efferent arterioles, uh, with uh, hyaline, hyalinization, deposition of protein in the, in the arterioles, and then interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy is, is critical for the final stages of diabetic kidney disease and progressive decline in kidney function. But we think, most of us think at least, that these initial changes are probably pretty important. And then you'll see eventually these sorts of uh, glomerular changes. This is the classic Kimmel-Steele Wilson nodular glomerular sclerosis. This is more diffuse mesangial sclerosis, equally common. Um, and one point that I'll make is that these changes uh, happen before there's any clinical evidence of kidney disease. So my next question, which you're probably already going to guess the answer to, is how do we screen for DKD very poorly, right? Because we don't pick up those changes. And I'll show you one piece of data uh, to substantiate that in a minute. But this is what the ADA tells us based on their yearly diabetes care publication. This, this is what the ADA tells us how to screen for diabetic kidney disease, right? We look for abnormal amounts of urinary albumin, just following that old Mogison time course. So that's supposed to be the first thing you'll pick up. But they realize that that doesn't always work, and so uh, based on some recent data, and I'll show you that in a minute, now we have to also look at the estimated GFR on a yearly basis to make sure we pick up early decline in kidney function. 
but the main point is that these are inadequate. These are just not going to pick up early disease. And, uh, and this piece of data from the NIDDK group in, in Phoenix that studies the Pima Indian population, it's probably the best studied type 2 population in the world, uh, and they've done uh, uh, serial biopsies uh, on patients who've participated voluntarily in, in a number of different studies, including some randomized controlled trials of, of angiotensin receptor blocker therapy. And the, the point to make on this slide is in this group. This is a group that has no evidence of kidney disease, normal albuminuric, completely normal GFRs. And they actually do measured GFRs, not estimated ones. So if you look at all the things that I just told you are important in terms of prognostication of, of a badness in terms of progressive kidney disease, so global sclerosis, mesangial expansion, GBM width, podocyte loss, and then even the interstitial changes, which I told you are late changes, all of these in this completely clinically silent group are much more like those that have progressive kidney disease than normal. And this was a very careful morphometric study looking at these biopsies. <coughs> so we do a lousy job screening for diabetic kidney disease. And this is true for chronic kidney disease in general, but it's true in spades for diabetic kidney disease. So just to sort of take away even our last vestige of thinking we know what we're doing, uh, you know, if people have, have held on to microalbuminuria as the main thing that indicates whether uh, folks are going to have diabetic kidney disease. I've just shown you that you can't even use that uh, to detect early disease anymore. But uh, how does it work as a prognostic indicator? Does it, does it at least help us in getting, identifying folks that are more likely to have progressive kidney disease. And it does work, not great, but it does work in that regard. And that's shown here, this is studies from the Joslin. Um, so if you have progressive microalbuminuria, certainly your risk down the road of progressive decline in your GFR is much higher than if you don't have progression or if you actually go back to normal in terms of your albumin in the urine. Uh, so that's, it's not perfect, but it does have some prognostic value. Uh, but it's not adequate uh, because we still miss a lot of people who have what w we would say would be completely normal uh, kidney function and no microscopic album albuminuria. It, it either goes away or it never happens. And even in these groups, about a sixth of them or a little more will have ultimately progressive decline in their kidney function. So it's not a great indicator for that either. So we're really kind of in a bad, bad shape. But fortunately, I think, we've got markers that are near sufficient validation to start to be used clinically. The one that's furthest ahead are the PNF receptors. These were published, again, by the Joslin group a few years ago for the first, in the first uh, set of studies and showed that patients that have the highest quartile of PNF receptor levels in their plasma, interestingly, not in the urine, uh, had a very high uh, likelihood of a cumulative risk of ESRD, uh, whether they had albuminuria or not. Uh, those that had albuminuria, as I just showed you, had a higher risk to begin with, but if you had that plus a high PNF receptor level, you had a very, very high chance of ESRD, while well, well, if you had a lower level, you had a much lower chance. And a number of confirmatory studies have been done. This one looks at all-cause mortality, probably the, capturing those cardiovascular deaths that happen with diabetic kidney disease, and showed similar results, which is that those in the highest quartile had the most likely uh, 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 risk of dying over the, the length of that study compared to those in the lowest quartile. And, the, and in this study, the other two quartiles fell uh, in between. This is being pursued very actively by a number of companies. I think that probably in the next two to three years, we will see an assay for this available commercially. It's my hope and prediction. So that we can use it both as a way to screen potentially for early disease, but also 
have an additive factor that will tell us which of our patients will progress. And then just uh, about 10 days ago, and I'm bragging about my colleagues here because this came out of uh, Matthias Kretzler's group, and Wenju was the, the first author uh, up in our, our, uh, our place. Um, so they found, uh, using a, a, what I would say was a very elegant systems biological approach, uh, going from transcriptomic analysis to, to finally urine protein uh, detection, uh, they were able to show that urinary um, EGF, epidermal growth factor, uh, predicts in patients uh, from three different cohorts around the world uh, pretty well and much better than albumin uh, progressive disease. And so when they added this in these three different cohorts to the current standard, which is using those two tools I've told you about that aren't very adequate, which is GFR and, and uh, initial GFR and albumin in terms of albumin creatinine ratios, when they added this urinary EGF on, they showed a much better uh, predictive value based on C st statistics, uh, highly significant in three different cohorts, including uh, cohorts. These are not all diabetics. These are different types of CKD. Uh, this is an IGA nephropathy group from China and found that it, ha that it worked in all three cohorts. These were folks that did not have normal GFRs to begin with, so they haven't tested that yet in the, the group that we would like to, uh, to test it in, but, uh, but at least for those that, are, that have relatively preserved kidney function, it seems to add uh, tremendously to help you pick out those patients that are likely to progress. So I think there's hope for the future and, and for the relatively near future and being able to determine, number one, which patients are likely to progress, and hopefully some of these markers will allow us to pick up patients before they have albuminuria or a decline in their GFR uh, for those that are destined to have kidney disease. So how do we treat DKD just as bad as we screen for it, right? So I'll, I'll show you that in, in a minute. Um, this is my very simple-minded view of how diabetic kidney disease happens. First of all, have that, that preglomerular vasodilation. This I've completely borrowed from Tom Hostetter. This, he published this probably 25 years ago. Um, that preglomerular vasodilation leads to glomerular hypertension. It also opens up the glomerulus to effects of systemic hypertension. Normally, your afferent arterial will, will close down when there's systemic hypertension, but not in diabetes. But that's not enough. So you need all these other factors both hyperglycemia and the right genetic background will lead to conditions that promote probably the major uh, abnormalities that lead to injury and, and, the, and the fibrosis and sclerosis that I told you about. And that's a group of changes that include oxidative stress that are triggered off by, by local inflammation. And so we'll come back to that in a bit. So, so what do we do about this schema now? Well, we know about glycemic control, right? So and I don't want to uh, at all belittle what you can do with glycemic control, particularly early on. It is so critical um, because it reverses most of this pathogenic schema, right? You get rid of that preglomerular vasodilation in a couple weeks after you get good control. You get rid of the glomerular hypertension. Therefore, hyperglycemia is under better control, fewer of these downstream effectors of the damage and things just get a lot better. And I know you know all this, but I, I show you this slide that was uh, published a few years ago by the DCCT edict group. So uh, just to remind you, these are the investigators that have followed this group of type 1 diabetic patients for the last 30 years. They first enrolled them in the randomized control trial that proved that glycemic control worked to reduce complications. That was in this first five-year period. They had an intensive diabetes therapy group, which now is just conventional treatment. Uh, so this was aiming for an A1C of 7. Conventional diabetes therapy would be highly inadequate therapy now. Um, but look at what happens in these groups, and this sort of un underlines the, the uh, point that I made earlier. The first point is that these groups had different glycemic control only here, only in the first five years. After that, it's completely the same. But in the group that received the more intensive therapy, 
they had a much better outcome in terms of their kidney disease than did the conventional diabetes group. Um, and this is what's been termed metabolic memory. The other important thing is that this is indicating, again, how long a lag time there is. Because if you look at this group, even the poorly controlled group, at 25 years, only 10% have kidney disease. Now, that's going to continue to increase, right? So in, an, in another 10, 15, 20 years, this group will be up probably to uh, 40, 50%. But at this point, uh, th there's not a whole lot of kidney disease, even after 25 years. So we're looking at a very long lag time now. All right. Blood pressure control, I've alluded to this before, and I'm not going to show you any data because there's just so much of it. But controlling blood pressure is so critical, not just because it's critical for all sorts of reasons, but because it has a direct impact on the glomerular hypertension and driving all these other factors. The one treatment that we do know about that helps with blood pressure and some of these other factors, and there's been a lot of data, and you don't know this very well, or treatment with ACEs and ARB, um, affects the pathogenic schema in all the ways that I'm talking about and reduces oxidative stress and inflammation in the glomerulus. This was that study came out the same year the DCCT did, 22 years ago. We haven't made any progress since then. So this shows that captopril, the first ACE inhibitor, um, did show uh, when, when given to patients that had already established diabetic kidney disease and a reduced GFR, uh, did slow down progression of disease sub substantially and significantly, about a 40% reduction in the progression towards these very severe endpoints. So this is end-stage renal disease, death, and doubling of serum creatinine, the three Ds, doubling, death, and dialysis. Uh, this is what pharma companies have to achieve to be able to get a drug uh, registered for diabetic kidney disease. Uh, so ACE inhibitors were shown. More recently, ARBs were shown to do the same thing. And now we know that we've tried to do this in all sorts of ways. We give ACE inhibitors at night. We give them in the morning. We give them with ARBs. We give them with other drugs. We scratch people's backs, and it still comes out the same. So, you know, they get ACE. You know, it doesn't work to add both together, and it's the only thing we have right now that works. Uh, so the, this study from the VA and Efron B showed that, although there's a little, there was a trend, that adding an ARB to an ACE did not statistically improve outcomes. And this is, again, the same set of outcomes I just showed you, change in creatinine, death, or dialysis. Um, but the main problem was that there was a huge increase in complications with the group that got both therapies. So increased severe hyperkalemia, increased AKI. Uh, so not necessarily for everybody, but in general, we're no longer using ACEs and ARBs together uh, for diabetic kidney disease. There probably still is uh, a reason to, at least there's not a reason not to, uh, use uh, aldosterone antagonists. This is just a recent study in JAMA using a so-called non-steroidal aldo antagonist. Uh, and showing that, at least in a short-term study, there's a dose-dependent improvement in albuminuria, which may predict, but not necessarily, uh, long-term outcomes. And in this, with this particular type of uh, aldosterone antagonist, there wasn't a big change in potassium levels in this group. So uh, they're uh, pushing this. It's not out there yet. It's not even been approved yet. It's uh, the drug is called nirinone. Uh, but uh, but the main reason I wanted to show this is probably the only time you're going to have a nephrologist recommend non-steroidals. So, uh, you know. Um, and then there is some indication that if you just throw everything together, except ACEs and ARBs together, uh, that you do get good outcomes in a subset of your patients with either type 1 or type 2 disease. So if you do everything you can do, including lipid control, although lipid control has not been shown independently to improve outcomes, but in this mix of patients that were done by the Steno group in Denmark, uh, they found that if you could get good blood pressure control, good glycemic control, good lipid control, and have an ACER-ARB, uh, that there was a pretty high likelihood 
of regression of your kidney disease. Now, this is in early patients. So these are patients that have albuminuria and very little decline in their GFR. This was published over a decade ago. And it's still probably all we can do right now. And there may be, you may be able to stabilize, at least slow down about a third of your patients if you can do this. Put them all together. And there is evidence that if you can get the albuminuria to go down, like they did in that study, particularly if it goes back down to normal, that you will have fewer cardiovascular and, and, and kidney events in terms of progression of kidney disease and cardiovascular endpoints. So there is good reason to do all that. I don't want to let you think that I'm a therapeutic nihilist at this point. We can do stuff that helps, helps people. And since this is Grand Rounds, I'm going to show you my one patient uh, who's done extraordinarily well in this regard. So this is a 39-year-old woman who had type 1 diabetes for most of her life since she was 18 months old. I started seeing her as an adolescent, actually. Uh, things got a little awry in her late adolescence. Uh, blood pressure went up. Albuminuria went way up. It looked pretty bad. Her GFR was going down. Uh, she got religion, uh, not due to me. Thank you. She finally decided to kind of take care of herself better, uh, started back on her ACE inhibitor. Uh, and her GFR leveled out. Albuminuria came down. Um, blood pressure control got a lot better. In fact, I, have to, I had to take her off the ACE a few years ago. Um, these graphs only go out to 2009 because we changed our electronic health record. I can't do it anymore. So, uh, but her latest, I'm sorry, her latest uh, levels are still in the same range. Serum creatinine is still 1.12 with an eGFR of about 50. Uh, protein levels are down to normal in her urine. A1C is not great, 7.9. Blood pressure is still 100 over 70. And uh, she's got good lipid control. She even got through pregnancy. Uh, had pretty bad albuminuria, preeclampsia. Baby was delivered rapidly, but did well. Uh, so she's doing okay. So this can happen right now, even with our inadequate treatment. So I don't want you to think that we shouldn't do anything. We can get this kind of stability in a minority of our patients. But why haven't we made any progress in the last 22 years since that Capitol study in 2003? Well, I've alluded to some of them. One is that it just takes such a long time for diabetic kidney disease to progress. We don't have good ways to diagnose people after they've had damage and until it's maybe too late. Um, and it's just hard to, uh, for drug companies to put in the resources to study such a long pathogenesis. So that's why all the studies have been in folks that already had pretty severe disease, because you have to have an endpoint that you can measure. There are no great animal models of diabetic kidney disease. I spent most of my career proving that point, <laughs> which is not not very good thing to keep working about, but that's what I've done. And so, uh, and uh, the endpoints are difficult that I've already uh, alluded to. And then maybe we're just lazy and stupid. Uh, I, we're not lazy. Um, anyway, maybe all of the above. So, uh, so maybe stupid. Um, so, so how will we treat DKD in the future? So I think, as I mentioned at the at the outset here, that we're really at a at a tipping point. That's what my colleague uh, Kathy Tuttle calls it right now. She's a, a very well established, one of the best uh, clinical and and translational researchers in diabetic kidney disease at University of Washington, and 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 she thinks and has convinced me and. I believe that we may be at that point where we're really going to be able to offer new treatment and something that will be better than what we can do now. Something that's very recently come out, and I know the nephrologists in the room are aware of this, but maybe not everybody is, is uh, the studies with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, as you know, there's a lot of controversy right now about SGLT2 treatment and, and what the, some of the potential side effects with DKA and other uh, adverse effects uh, in, uh, in urinary tract infections and, and, and a host of others with these inhibitors. But if you look at their mode of action, they actually do do a lot of good things uh, in terms of our pathogenic schema. They, due to their effects on tubic glomerular feedback, which I will not try and explain to you today, uh, they uh, will reduce that vasodilation in the afferent arterial, 
also actually have antihypertensive effects. Clearly get the blood sugar to go down by being out the sugar and probably other uh, 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 other effects. And uh, they've been shown, at least in animal studies, to reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. So they do a lot of good things. And many of you are aware, it was just published uh, about a month ago, uh, the, the Emperor trial that surprisingly, I think, uh, showed that its treatment with empagliflozin, I can never pronounce that, uh, reduces cardiovascular outcomes and death, all-cause mortality. Pretty impressive results with many of these endpoints. Uh, and I think this surprised a number of people. I'm sure it made the drug companies happy. But, uh, but there was, a, and then, just last month at the neurology meetings, they did an analysis. It was a pre-specified analysis to look at results on kidney disease. And this is my version of that graph, because these are not available. This is completely unauthorized version, OK? So uh, don't, don't copy this. Uh, so um, this is sort of more or less what it looked like. So uh, and it was very impressive. So there was an immediate reduction in GFR in the patients that had CKD already uh, and were included in this trial, a minority of the larger study. Uh, and that was due to the effects on the hyperfiltration. It was actually probably quicker than what I drew it here. But then they pretty much stabilized over uh, almost a five-year period, a four-year period, rather. And the SIBO group continued to truck along with decreasing GFR. This is a very impressive result. This has not been published yet. Nobody has really had a chance to look at this in a critical way. So, you know, don't go out and prescribe EMPA to your patients with diabetic kidney disease, okay? <laughs> Please. I'll be arrested or something. I don't know what will happen. But, uh, but pay attention to this. This was a summary that uh, somebody else wrote about that presentation at the ASN uh, last month. And uh, so this uh, outcome trial showed, you know, it's a pretty good sized group, even in the CKD group, um, uh, that uh, there was a 39% reduction in new onset or worsening of nephropathy. And it started very early. Um, and they actually achieved those sort of hard endpoints, the doubling of the serum creatinine, dialysis, and death uh, by 46%. So that's a big, that's a bigger effect than ACE inhibitors. And these are in patients that were already on ACE inhibitors. So if these are substantiated, this is a big deal, OK? So we'll turn to a couple other potential new treatments that may hopefully be coming out in the next five years. Um, and I'm going to remind you, I've been telling you that inflammation is an important aspect of the progression of chronic kidney disease. This happens both in the glomeruli and the tubular interstitium. Um, and there's been a lot of emphasis right, uh, recently over the last 10 years on the role of monocyte macrophages, just like there has in every other disease process probably. Um, and, uh, and the reason I show this slide is just to indicate a couple things. One is that many of the factors that we've known have played a role, the, I haven't talked to you about advanced glycation end products, but those through receptor-mediated and non-receptor-mediated signaling uh, turn on an inflammatory cascade and, and uh, increase uh, reactive oxygen species <coughs> accumulation and trigger off a number of other signaling pathways that may be important in the resident glomerular cells uh, to cause uh, fibrosis. And a lot of these are regulated in the monocyte macrophage by activation uh, of those macrophages by MCT1. And we'll come back to a study with that. First, though, I'll tell you about a little bit more developed uh, set of uh, potential uh, antag uh, or therapies uh, for diabetic kidney disease, the endothelin antagonists, because they have a big effect on inflammation as well as some other things. So these drugs reduce oxidative stress uh, by inhibiting endothelin A uh, and EP1 receptors, the EPA receptors, and um, uh, reduce inflammation uh, in part through that mechanism. Uh, they also have either direct or indirect effects through this mechanism on fibrosis and sclerosis in animal models, and actually are pretty good antihypertensives. And those sort of effects are, are noted here. So uh, EP1 binds to the EPA receptors and uh, has been shown to have a number of protective effects 
on the podocytes and the zangial cells and the glomerulus, some important tubular effects as well. And so there is good reason to think these drugs might be effective in diabetic kidney disease. Um, the problem has been uh, in their side effects. But uh, there are good phase two studies showing a pretty impressive reduction in albuminuria with treatment with endothelin antagonists. Um, and this is one of them that was published relatively recently. Um, showing a you know, pretty high percentage of folks with a greater than 40 or 50 percent reduction in their albuminuria, which tends to predict that they're going to do well in long-term studies. But again, the side effects are a problem. A lot of uh, hepatotoxicity and fluid retention and CHF resulting from these drugs, as you may know. And there are people with kidney disease that seem to do really badly with these antagonists. So this is not going to be for everybody, even if it's shown to be effective in, um, in groups uh, with uh, diabetic kidney disease. But I think it may be uh, for a subgroup of folks with, uh, who uh, are at low risk for complications uh, that have diabetic kidney disease. And there's a well-designed phase three study going on right now that should be published in the next year or two. And uh, we'll see what, see what happens there. Um, back to MCT1, I told you that this was a major signaling uh, mechanism, uh, MCT1, CCL2, binding to its receptor and macrophages and other cells. And it clearly has an effect on inflammation and oxidative stress. So this is a phase two study that we've just published uh, from a European group showing that uh, this particular CCR2 inhibitor or MCT1 inhibitor, uh, MCT1 receptor inhibitor, sorry, uh, had a nice uh, reduction in albuminuria, although it was only at the lower dose group, interestingly. And so they waved their hands a bit and said, well, maybe the high dose group didn't work as well because it actually increased MCT1 levels due to blocking of its receptor. Don't know yet. We're not sure that this is going to be a great drug for the future, but it might be. And then I'll finally bore you with some uh, phase two study results from a uh, 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 JAK1-2 inhibitor uh, that uh, some of our uh, research led, uh, led to this clinical trial. And so these JAK1-2 signaling is important, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, in many inflammatory and autoimmune processes and should have some effect on inflammation and oxidative stress. And it also may have some effect in reducing uh, preglomerular vasodilation. So, um, Results from our group a, a number of years ago, and this is collaborative uh, studies uh, that were done by Celine Berthier and Matthias Kretzler's group and uh, Hong Yu Zhang and my group, um, and uh, basically showed that in humans, uh, there was a big increase in JAK1, 2, 3 expression, as well as a number of the STAT isoforms, which are their signaling partners downstream, uh, in the glomerulus of uh, patients with early diabetic kidney disease. Actually, this is the PEMA group that we've already talked about. And that kind of went da back down towards normal in more progressive disease, but then went up big time in folks with progressive disease and with tubular interstitium. So it sort of followed the progression of disease uh, with diabetic kidney disease. And there was very tight correlation between expression of all these uh, JAK stat members and the uh, estimated GFR. Uh, of our patients uh, in these studies um, showing our squared values of uh, approaching 0.5. And, uh, and so indicated that there might be something going on in the system. And I won't show you any other of the results that, that confirm that. But I will remind you that JAK-STAT signaling mechanisms are involved in many chemokine and cytokine signaling uh, transduct or signal transduction uh, in a number of cell types. Uh, and these can be mediated by different uh, JAK isoforms, so JAK1, JAK2, JAK3 is not on here, but JAK2 is the fourth one, and, uh, and, and through different stats. And depending on the, the combination of these and the cell type, and the, uh, it will have different effects. But these, um, these have been looked at uh, pretty, uh, uh, I guess, strongly by many of the pharma companies because Clearly, the signaling is involved in a number of different uh, diseases that are either autoimmune diseases or inflammatory diseases that uh, may be mediated uh, through this system. And so uh, 
psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis have been two of the ones that have been looked at most, inflammatory bowel disease as well. And so about uh, a couple years after our study was published, the folks at Lilly who were developing one of these drugs for rheumatoid arthritis uh, came to talk to us about maybe using this for diabetic kidney disease. And we said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And, and uh, so they went ahead and, and did a phase two study, uh, which I was able to be involved in, uh, and um, treated type two patients uh, who were already on an ACE or an ARB and had uh, some reduction in their GFR with still high albuminuria, so high risk patients. Uh, and, uh, and just did a six month study of several doses um, you know, with a washout period of four to eight weeks. And um, we had trouble finding, fortunately, I guess, finding patients that were this high risk that still had that much albuminuria. Uh, but they went, uh -oh, they went ahead and did the study even though we didn't enroll uh, what we'd wanted to. The primary endpoint was just looking at that reduction in albuminuria. Um, and we're able to find a nice reduction in albuminuria that was more or less dose dependent uh, that even persisted uh, after four weeks of washout of the, of the drug. And I think just as importantly, we were able to see sort of target engagement by reducing inflammatory markers. Uh, so ICP-10 or CXCL-10 in the urine was reduced nicely by this treatment. MCP-1, which I'm talking about, was also reduced uh, by the treatment, kind of went away, well, maybe, maybe persisted, but not statistically in the washout period. And then those TNF receptors, which I told you were maybe the best marker for progressive uh, uh, kidney decline in our diabetic patients, uh, those levels were reduced as well, both TNFR2 and TNFR1. So there's a lot of new stuff on the horizon, and, I, and the nice thing is that many of these drugs are going to be FDA approved or are already FDA approved. And so even though I can't tell you to use them and would not even think of that uh, at this point, uh, they may be available for our use in patients before very long. And so I think it's a time for hope. So this is where we are. Uh, early glycemic control clearly is a goal for early, particularly in those folks that have early, uh, when they're early in their disease. So right after the onset of diabetes, it's so important in minimizing kidney disease down the road. The, those combination of blood pressure control, low sodium diet, which I didn't show you, but is very true. ACEs and ARBs, probably lipid control as well, are important. We're a little uncertain where our blood pressure target should be at this point, so I didn't talk about that, but, uh, uh, but uh, we can talk about it if you have questions. Maybe, and I can't say that there's a good long-term studies with aldo antagonists, but many studies have confirmed that, lip, that lowering uh, effect on albuminuria and, and certainly have good cardiovascular protection. This exciting new evidence that SGLT2 inhibitors, at least EMPA, may dramatically reduce progression. Stay tuned. Don't use them yet. Uh, and there are other new trials going on, and I didn't even summarize even a majority of the trials that are out there that are going on that are looking and have a lot of promise, I think, for the future in terms of treating this, this uh, very uh, important and growing uh, cause of uh, end-stage renal disease, but also, more importantly, cardiovascular mortality. So that was my story for today. I worked with a lot of these people, and we showed just a teeny bit of, of the stuff that we've done, um, and I want to acknowledge all them because none of this was really from me. And um, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to talk about uh, this some more if you have questions, but thanks again. <laughs>
Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I think we have to uh, we have to have those talks. I do every day in clinic. That's why I get behind in clinic, you know. <laughs> so uh, uh, because you know we're the we're the fattest northern state, uh, so we have that distinction. Uh, I'm not sure where we are vis-a-vis -vis Kentucky. We're about the same, I think. Um, and uh, you know, physical activity has actually been shown fairly recently to improve kidney outcomes too. So, but the main thing, and I, I hope I drum uh, this message out uh, loud enough is that, you know, our patients are dying from cardiovascular complications, not from their kidney disease mostly. People that make advanced stage renal disease are the survivors. So we're really trying to prevent cardiovascular mortality, and of course all these things are critical for that. And, you know, I practice what, what I preach and go out in the morning and exercise, uh, and, uh, and I tell them that. And I say, you know, tell them you know, over and over again. It's just like telling them to stop smoking, right? It doesn't work the first time. So, yes. Oh boy, <laughs> I saw you first uh, in the back, and then we'll come down. I mean you in the red. In the red, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Vitamin E didn't work. Tetoxifilin is still being looked at. It might have some effects. Yeah. So it's a, you're right. Maybe all these antifibrotics, and, and we're still very encouraged about potential stronger antifibrotics having an effect. Yeah. I, I don't know who to call on. I saw you. Great question. So we haven't tended to biopsy historically in diabetes, right? Uh, we know that in type 2 populations, so type 1 populations, it's pretty clear that if you've got albuminuria, you know, as an indicator uh, that any kidney disease you have is going to be diabetic nephropathy, virtually 95, 98%. You know, and there'll be some odd other circumstances in which we will biopsy those patients. Type 2, it's a different story. There's often other disease. It's often atherosclerotic disease or hypertensive disease or what we call hypertensive disease. Um, and so there's, uh, we have not tended to biopsy for clinical indications because usually we're not going to treat people a whole lot differently. However, I think based on the implication of your question is one that I, I think is actually affecting the field, which is should we be biopsying early? to try and, since we don't have good biomarkers, should we be biopsying more often when we first see disease to get an idea of how severe the disease really is because our clinical indicators are lousy. And um, I think as we move, as, as you guys have, we have an interventional nephrology unit that does a lot of our biopsies now, and so it's not me going and do my five biopsies a year, you know, where I, <laughs> uh, and so, um, I think we feel that under controlled circumstances with the right, uh, rightly prepared people and not doing people who you are at high risk, that the, that the complication rate of biopsies can be, can be low enough to make that justifiable. That's not where we are yet, but I think there's a move in that direction. If we get better biomarkers that don't involve sticking the needle in the kidney, it be even better yet. I saw somebody in the back and I, yeah, okay. Well, so that study was CKD3. So uh, uh, at least the subgroup that they analyzed, their average GFR was, well, CKD2, CKD3. It was right at that border. So um, we don't know. I think, again, I don't want to make a, a huge deal of those results. That's a single study. It was a subgroup analysis. It was pre-specified, clearly, but so I think it was valid. But boy, that has to be confirmed in another study before we know. I think your questions are great, uh, uh, and, and hopefully somebody's 
gotten that trial set up to do right now. I'm hoping Lilly and DI, who own that drug, are doing it right now, but I don't know. Yes, sir. Yeah, so there's been uh, a great, uh, there's, there's certainly been a uh, suggestion that TDGF is playing an important role uh, in diabetic kidney disease progression. It probably is. Uh, interestingly, the EGF, uh, which I didn't uh, sort of underline enough, uh, and I'm not answering your question, I'm just like a politician here, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, is a protective. So EGF is protective. Uh, protective. TG, TDGF has been felt to be not protective and pathogenic. Uh, I don't know uh, of uh, I don't know of human studies that have have documented uh, TDGF's role. There have been a lot of animal studies, which unfortunately are not always correlative. So, yes. Sir. It's a great question, and I'm not the right one to answer that. I, I think it's just that, um, you know, it's just like anything else. You're going to have more impact before you have damage or much damage. So I think if you can uh, get through that period where you're starting to lay down scar uh, in the, the kidney, you're going to have much better outcomes. It's just, it's just you know, having a little lever at the start is going to be bigger than having a big lever at the end. And most of our other studies that show things that are effective have been only done in, in patients that are further down the pike. Now, that's not to say that ACE inhibitors work early on. They probably don't because they're different mechanisms. And, uh, but glycemic control seems to affect those very early processes in diabetic nephropathy that I think sets the stage for the progression. And so if you can interrupt that even for a while, you're going to have a much better outcome down the road. I think they still get disease because for all sorts of reasons, uh, but they, but fewer patients get disease and they get it much later. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think I answered your question, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the, the great question as well, and I don't have an answer for that either. Uh, uh, people have looked a little bit at, uh, at, at uh, so, so there's certainly uh, toll-like receptors that are activated that are important in glomerular disease and probably are important in diabetic kidney disease. Um, where the knowledge is a little better, though, are in, in uh both macrophage and T, you know, sort of T cell mediated responses uh, in the glomerulus, and to a little, to a little lesser extent, the tubular interstitium. So, but, but I think the, the field's still open, and and it's a hard, hard disease to study because of the duration, and the number of responses that you get. But there's certainly been activation of, of, of virtually any inflammatory pathway you can look at, and how how critical those are pathogenically, I think, needs to be still sorted out. Thanks, Jeff. Thank oh, you for yeah. a wonderful talk. Yeah. All of our guest speakers ah. have been very kind. Oh, dear. A world of struggle. Oh, thank you. Can I get that on the plane? Yeah. No, you cannot. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. I will not demonstrate my swing right now, but thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, sir.